Folks, welcome back to another episode of The Fallen Badge. Today we're going to look at the murder of Trooper Brian Dixon II, Pennsylvania State Police. Trooper Dixon, he had attained the rank of corporal with the uh, state police. Now, he'd been a Marine, so he had served his country and was serving the citizens of the state of Pennsylvania. Now, he'd been a trooper seven years, and he had a wife and two sons. Now, he had been working at the trooper barracks up in the Philadelphia area, but he had recently transferred down to Blooming Grove Barracks. Now that was up in the Pocono Mountains there in Pennsylvania. Not too far from the New York and the New Jersey state lines. Now the information I'm going to use for our story it's going to come from the appellate court there in Pennsylvania. Now it's about 10.45 p.m. on September the 12th, 2014. Corporal Dixon has just finished up his 3 to 11 shift. And he walks into the police barracks there in Pike County. Now he, he doesn't park there on the lower parking lot. He's up at the public entrance. Now he goes in through the front doors where the public lobby is, and then he goes back through the controlled access door and goes into the office. Now, after a few minutes, he leaves the office. He steps into the communications room, which is close to the public lobby, and he wishes the dispatchers a good evening before he leaves. Corporal Dixon then steps out of the communications room, walks through the controlled access door, goes back into the public lobby, and then he's stepping out the front door. Now the dispatcher would later say that she had just answered a phone call when she heard a gunshot. Now she looked out the communications window and she saw Corporal Dixon laying on the sidewalk just outside the lobby doors. Now the dispatcher, she runs to the lobby, then she hears a second shot. Now she opened the lobby doors and she asked Corporal Dixon what had happened. He just mouthed the words, help me. Now the dispatcher, her name's Palmer, she retreats back into the lobby and she's trying to get in touch with someone in the back because she has locked herself out of the controlled access doors. So she goes back to the front doors and she talks to Corporal Dixon again. And he tells her, I've been shot, drag me inside. Now finally the second dispatcher comes to the lobby doors and Palmer tells her to, to get on the radio and call for help that an officer's been shot. Now, about the same time all this is happening, another trooper, Alex Douglas, now he works the 11P to 7A shift. So he's just beginning his shift that night. Now, he pulls up to the Blooming Grove Police Barracks. Now, he's in a marked cruiser. And there's three other troopers there are evidently around the, the front of the barracks. Now those those troopers into the barracks and Douglas he's kind of lagging behind. Now when he heard the gunshots he had looked up towards the front of the barracks and he saw Corporal Dixon was down on the ground. So he drew his weapon and he went to Corporal Dixon. 
Now, Douglas gets to Trooper Dixon, and while he's bent over him, trying to render assistance, Trooper Douglas gets shot in the hip. He goes down. Now, he's able to crawl and push his way into the barracks because his legs don't work, so he's having to do this with his arms. And he's trying to get to a position where he's no longer in sight of the sniper He just knows the shots are coming from across the road, but he doesn't know where. Now, two troopers from inside the building run, and they drag Douglas from the lobby area back into the barracks. Now, the other troopers want to try to get to Corporal Dixon, but they know that the sniper is out there, and if they get out in that parking lot, they're going to get shot. So they devise a plan because... From what I read from the resource material, all the troopers still in the building are all Marines. So one of them gets an SUV and he pulls it up in front and uses it to block the sight of the sniper. And they use ballistic shields from inside the building and they're able to go out the front doors and drag Corporal Dixon into the barracks. Now they begin CPR and They used the AED to try to revive Corporal Dixon. Now, eventually, EMS workers arrive. They work on Corporal Dixon. Finally, he's pronounced dead. Now, the autopsy they did on Corporal Dixon later indicated he suffered two gunshot wounds, one in the upper right chest and a second in his shoulder. Now, according to the ME, both these wounds were fatal. Now, they knew the sniper had fired rounds from the woods area somewhere across the road from the barracks, but that's all they knew. Locate three spent rounds from in front of the barracks, and that includes the two bullets that went through Corporal Dixon and also the one that had hit Trooper Douglas. Now, when they get into the woods themselves, across from the police barracks, they recover four empty 308 caliber rifle casings. Now, they noticed on the casings, they're stamped AFF-88. Now, also, while they're over there in in the woods, they saw one tree that had been hit by a bullet And then there was another tree where they actually were able to recover a bullet from the tree. Now they used a laser and crime scene was able to determine where the shooter was actually standing. Now according to the police investigation, that AFS stands for Ammunition Factory Footscray. And now that is a town there in Melbourne, Australia. And 88 tells you what year the rounds were manufactured. Now later in the day on the 14th, a man's walking his dog and he's in the area of Route 402 and Highway 6. Now police later theorized and a journal entry in the Suspect's little diary confirmed the theory that when the suspect left the area in the Cherokee, he went down 402 northbound and he got to, or that may have been eastbound, but when he gets near the junction of Highway 6, the suspect sees a roadblock on the road there evidently somewhere around Highway 6 and he turns off on one of the gravel roads or something near there. Anyways, he goes back country. Well, he's got his lights out and he doesn't realize he's coming up to a T intersection and he just straightens it out and runs his vehicle into the pond. So then he has to get what he can out of his vehicle and beat feet 
And when he did, he worked his way back southbound. Now he sees a green Jeep Cherokee stuck in a retaining pond there in that woods. Now it's about two to three miles from the Blooming Grove police barracks. Now he looks inside the Jeep and he sees an open gun case and various military supplies. So he contacts the state police. Now some of the items the police found when they arrived, they found a registration card that identified the owner of the vehicle. Now that would later turn out to be the suspect's father and mother. Now they found an expired Pennsylvania driver's license that was issued to the suspect. They find camouflage paint, a tube of it, and they find some other items So now with this vehicle and the information that they've gathered from the contents of the vehicle, they're figuring this is their suspect for sure. Also, something else of interest they had found, they found two empty rifle casings in the back of the vehicle, and they were stamped with AFF-88. So now you've got casings from that vehicle and from the shooter's position in the woods that tie in together. Now while they're checking the area around the Cherokee, they find an AK-47 rifle. Now it had a magazine with 27 live rounds in it, one in the chamber. And they find a backpack with more magazines for the weapon. Now on September 15th, police do a search warrant at the parents' house of who they consider to be their suspect. Now in the garage, they find a workbench and they find expended rounds of ammunition. And on those casings, they're stamped AFF-88. So now we've got a tie-in between the shooting scene, the Cherokee, and the house where the suspect lives with his parents. Now this search would go on for 48 days looking for the suspect. They had the uh, state of New York and the state of New Jersey assisted. In fact, they had just about every law enforcement agency you could think of was up there looking. So on that 48th day, U.S. Marshals have one of their special operations groups. Now they're checking a area around a airport that's no longer in service. It's Birchwood Pocono Air Park. Now while they're there checking that area, they observe a male white walking through the woods and through the field heading towards the hangar. Now that's where some of the marshals are at. So they wait till he gets up into the open and then they take him down. Now he doesn't resist and he's arrested. Now later during questioning, he would tell him where the rifle was at. That rifle was a Norinco 308 rifle. Now I don't know much about guns. I'd never even heard of that, that type rifle before that manufacturer but that's not a shock but he did confess to what he had done now of course later on there that confession is going to be contested by his defense attorneys when he was charged out and indicted he was charged with first degree murder First degree criminal homicide of a law enforcement officer. Criminal attempt to commit first degree murder. And criminal attempt to commit criminal homicide of a law enforcement officer. Assault of a law enforcement officer in the first degree. Terrorism. Weapons of mass destruction because they found a couple of pipe bombs he had made, by the way discharge of a firearm into an occupied structure, possessing instruments of crime, 
and recklessly endangering another person. Now, he had a trial, and they brought in a jury from another county, and they found him guilty. Now, he's on death row, and unfortunately, unless things change, I've probably got 15, 20 years before I kick off, and I seriously doubt I'll be alive when they execute him if they ever do. Now, the reason he did this because they found his journal, and in that journal he talked about he hoped this would be the spark that would start the revolution. Now, I don't know exactly what kind of revolution he wants. He's living in the greatest country in the world, and whatever issues you've got, I don't know how killing a police officer is somehow going to make things better. Now, Corporal Dixon's widow and Trooper Douglas, they both sued the parents. Evidently, there's allegations that the parents were pretty anti-government, anti-police. Now, they, that lawsuit was settled. I, I have no idea what the settlement was. Still just, uh, just amazed that you're going to take the life of a human being and attempt to take the life of a second one, and, and for what? I can think of no issue that's going to solve. Corporal Brian Keith Dixon the second. End of watch. September 12, 2014.